You're looking at the big picture with Edwin Eisentraff on WCPT 820. Okay, everybody, welcome back. It's a little after 3 o'clock here in the upper Midwest. And it's important that we do more than one thing at a time, right? With all the stuff going on in the rest of the world, we still have to look at some of the challenges here. And to help do that with me now is Andy Kroll, who covers voting, elections, and you know other democracy issues for ProPublica. He's a veteran of the D.C. press corps, was Washington's bureau, Washington bureau chief for um, uh, Rolling Stone and a senior reporter at Mother Jones. And lately, he's been part of a reporting team digging into one of my favorite topics on this show, a man named Leonard Leo. And his latest fabulous story takes us inside the machine that Leo built to remake the legal system. Um, and, uh, and I think for the first time, this piece, uh, uh, unveils what Leo's next target is. Um, Andy, welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, uh, I, I almost just want to say go, but I'll, I'll help <laughs> go through this. Like, let's, but let's start where your article does, because I think even though we talk about Leonard Leo on this show some, um, it's worth spending some time giving everybody the background about who he is and how pervasive his influence in the judiciary is. Because, I mean, everybody knows he helped pick Supreme Court justices, but that's not close to the whole story. No, not not close at all. It's really just a, a, a small but important piece of that story. And, you know, that's what we really set out to do with this new investigation for ProPublica was to tell the full story of a man who we would all argue is one of the most influential yet little known figures in all of American politics over the last 40 years. I mean, you know, Leo, if people have heard of him at all, they maybe hear the name and say, oh yeah, he had something to do with Trump, right? Or Oh yeah, like he has something to do with the Federalist Society, this the you know network of conservative and libertarian lawyers. But really, you know, the name apart from the sort of uh, you know curiousness of it, the name itself, Leonard Leo, uh, just does not register with uh, as many people as we thought it would. And so we said, okay, we're going to write the story so that when people hear the name Leonard Leo, they know who we're talking about. And you know, it it, it is really the story of someone who more than 30 years ago, set out to build a sort of political and legal machine that would produce Supreme Court justices, that would produce state attorneys general, that would change the face of the American judiciary, pushing it further to the right, pushing it in the direction of these controversial legal doctrines called originalism and textualism, and would really start to in a big picture kind of way, roll back a lot of the advances of the mid to late 20th century. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here is someone who believed, Leonard Leo believed that the liberal Supreme Court majority under Chief Justice Earl Warren in the sort of mid 20th century, a court that, you know, ruled on Brown v. Board of Education, that ruled on birth control, that ruled on, you know, the Miranda rights for someone who's arrested, that ruled on so many things that we kind of take for granted now that we just assume are, are, are part of the fabric of this country. Leo set out to promote people, promote legal doctrines, promote organizations that would begin to reverse and roll back those 20th century changes. Roe v. Wade obviously being at the top of that list, but by no means limited to Roe v. Wade. So, so I hear you say that, and, and um, that sounds like they had, a, they had a, um, an idea about policy and the law, and they thought maybe things were wrongly decided. But as I read your whole piece, what I found was that that what what they created wasn't a legal movement so much as a political movement, and they turned the judiciary into a political um, uh, fight, which which means that justices make political rulings rather than jurisprudential ones. So in some ways, it feels like an anti-law movement to me. One that, that one that says you you can't 
you can't have a rule of law that sits outside of politics. So let's just make it politics. I, th- I think what, what fascinated us so much about Leo was how he kept appearing time after time at these really critical inflection points in the history of not just American jurisprudence, but as you rightly point out, American politics. Again, over the last three to four decades, Leonard Leo worked on Clarence Thomas's he fiercely contested confirmation fight in 1991. Leonard Leo helped elect George W. Bush in 2000, and especially in 2004. You know, Leo was there for John Roberts and Samuel Alito, obviously all three of the, the Trump Supreme Court appointments. But, you know, one of the, the, the sort of innovations or one of the, the changes in the American legal and political system that Leo really drove was bringing a political mindset and not just a political mindset, but a sort of war mentality in a political way to the judicial selection process in this country. And I'm talking about the Supreme Court and all the ways we document in the story that Leo, you know, brought in outside anonymous money. He created these, you know, campaign like organizations to run attack ads and to run positive ads and to, you know, influence senators. He did all of these things that really look a lot more like a, 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 an out and out political campaign than something to do with the, the third branch of government, the, ju- the judicial branch. He did that in Washington, but he also did it in the States. I mean, he's, that's, that's something we really hope people come away from. I, I want to turn story. to that in one second. Yeah. You, yeah. But, but while we're yeah. still on the Washington part, in order to do that, he also had to get judges to do things like rule on Citizens United the way they did. Right. So, so you have, you have the court he picked changing the rules to allow him to do what he does. Yeah. And, you know, the way that, I mean, the way that they see this is that this, this legal philosophy that guides people like Leo, guides people like Clarence Thomas, guides people like Samuel Alito, originalism and textualism in those worldviews, you know, the decisions like Citizens United are all for the good, you know, in a, in a, in a philosophical way, in an ideological way. Citizens United is the right decision. And, and frankly, originalism and textualism has driven the court to systematically erode all of the campaign finance regulations and protections that were put into place after Watergate and after the yep. major yep. scandals of the 70s. But, but you know, the thing you're pointing out and you're right to point it out is that it's also very convenient for them because these changes in how money flows into to politics uh, have also supercharged their efforts to continue putting more judges on the bench in the states and in Washington um, and in other federal courts who support less money and as you're sorry who support less regulations on money and politics so yeah. you have this sort of marriage of um, the ideology and then also the sort of real politic real politique, however you say that word, um, approach here. And that's where Leo is so interesting because he's someone who sits at the nexus of all of these things. He is someone who not only is, you know, he's, he's not a judge. He's not a, a lawyer arguing in court. He's not a f- government official. No, he, he's he's an someone an who takes advantage of all of these things. Yep. You, you wrote, I'm going to just read, uh, as we transition to the state, something from your piece. Decades ago, he realized it wasn't enough to have a majority in the Supreme, of Supreme Court justices to undo landmark rulings like Roe. His movement would need to make sure the court heard the right cases brought by the right people and heard by the right lower court judges. That was the entree. Talk about that. Yeah, I mean, this was the big intellectual breakthrough that we had on this story. This is what we, we want readers and listeners, because this, this story is also a three-part podcast, to really understand that Leo had a much larger vision for his machine than just a majority on the Supreme Court. And to think of him in the context only of the Supreme Court is to really, 
you know, be standing far too close to the picture and seeing only one corner of it when you really need to step back a few paces and see the whole thing. You know, he saw that, you know, the Supreme Court only hears a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of all the cases litigated in this country. Frankly, the federal appeals and the federal district courts also only hear a small percentage of all the cases heard. A lot of cases play out in the states and they get litigated and settled in state Supreme Courts. And again, I think Leo was ahead of his rivals on the liberal side of the spectrum in understanding this. I mean, we're talking the mid 2000s. He is going around talking about how important state Supreme Courts are, talking about how important state attorneys general are as well in challenging environmental regulations, campaign finance regulations, etc. And he starts building this machine so that it can not only touch the Supreme Court, touch the federal courts, but elect state Supreme Court judges, change how states appoint or elect their Supreme Court judges, and also get involved in those attorneys general's elections and then actions at the state level. You know, he really understood how important it was to start from the state level and work your way up because the Supreme Court is never going to overturn Roe v. Wade if you don't have the right people, right, meaning, you know, people who are allies of Leo's, you know, arguing the cases at the lower court level, building the case from the ground up so that it will one day get to the Supreme Court. This is his real insight and innovation that, that really no one else was doing at the time he was doing it. Right, because uh, that wasn't how the law worked until he made it work that way. You, you cited the Casey decision as a turning point. And just as a reminder, that was up the 5-4 decision um, that upheld uh, Roe v. Wade and was in 92. Um, and three Republic or three or four Republicans were on the side of three, I think, Kennedy, O'Connor, David Souter, yep. were all appointed by Republicans. And you wrote, here was the greatest challenge to the movement. Even an ostensibly conservative nominee could disappoint. So then he went on to, t- to target Republican nominees if they weren't ideologically right for him. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, a motto that bubbles up in the conservative legal movement not long after that Casey decision comes down. And the motto is, no more suitors. And what that means is the conservatives felt burned or misled or betrayed by David Souter, but also, frankly, by O'Connor and to some degree Kennedy as well, because they thought, OK, the president is a Republican uh, who has nominated these uh, these these three justices, several Republican presidents, actually. And, you know, they should be with us on the issue of abortion, which is obviously such a a critical and contentious issue. Um, for, for all, for both political parties. And these judges aren't with them. These judges rule in a way that, uh, uh, shocks and appalls the Leos of the world. And, you know, what Leo takes from this, 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 this no more suitors rallying cry is a lesson. And the lesson is this. They can't just expect a Republican appointed justice to be with them through a party affiliation, through some kind of, you know, uh, loyalty there. They're going to have to essentially cultivate and train and shape the minds of future lawyers, judges, and yes, Supreme Court justices, if they're going to want people to, in Leo's mind, you know, stiffen their spines and not feel the pressure from the outside and rule the way that the originalists think they should rule, you know. And so he creates again this this pipeline that just produces, you know, an entire generation of conservative and, lawyers. And the three judges that uh, Donald Trump put on the bench, I think, are all to some degree products of that pipeline that Leo had, you know, thought to, to, to put in motion three decades ago. And that pipeline had some parts where well, the, the transformation of the Federalist Society, which, as you say, shaped their minds and create that pipeline, but also the ju- so-called Judicial Confirmation Network which I think I have not talked about on this show. So it might be worth explaining to people what that is. Yeah. Well, the judicial confirmation network is, um, it's an interesting, almost like a recurring character in our story. And it's very illuminating to show how Leo thinks and how Leo operates. 
this group, uh, Judicial Confirmation Network, or JCN, as it's usually called, uh, comes up, uh, is created in part by Leo uh, in late 2004 and early 2005. This is in the Bush presidency, obviously. Bush has just been reelected. And it seems likely that Bush is finally going to have possibly one, possibly even two Supreme Court n- nominations to put up. And obviously, in the end, it was two. And what Leo believed was that you know, the, that, that the movement that conservatives needed some sort of outside artillery to uh, do battle on behalf of their nominees to the Supreme Court. You know, the memory of Robert Bork's defeat um, in the 80s when he was appointed by Reagan to the, to the Supreme Court and then, then voted down was still, believe it or not, fresh in the minds of people like Leonard Leo, even 10, 15 years later. So they decide, you know, we need big donors to give money to this outside group, JCN, that can run ads, that can put spokespeople on television, that can do all the kinds of quasi-political stuff that conservatives just did not do in the past when it came to judges, because judges are supposed to be neutral and impartial. You know, they're the umpires calling balls and strikes, as John Roberts so famously put it. Um, But the conservatives just did not do this until Leonard Leo came along. And now everyone does it. the, The liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, you name it. This is just the way the game is played. But Leo really understood this, uh, before a lot of other people did. And the, the story is filled with influence peddling. The Leo bringing donors together with the Supreme Court justices. The, the donors are awed by the honor of being with the justices. The justices are flattered by the fawning and Leo gets the cash. And I mean, you wrote about a, uh, 2017 gathering. I think it's worth talking about again. Eight super wealthy GOP funders and they met like in Clarence Thomas's chambers in the Supreme Court, I mean, like uh, that's not supposed to be partisan, but here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, this is definitely one of the more um, shocking and news-making details in the story. I, I'm glad that you you brought it up. I mean, th- you know, what, what, what we did, what we uncovered was a meeting of Republican mega donors. We're talking really, really high net worth people here. Um, who had originally been brought together in this donor club, a donor network by Paul Singer, the hedge fund billionaire, um, major conservative donor in his own right. If, if, you know, listeners out there have been following Supreme, the ProPublica Supreme Court coverage, you'll recognize Singer's name. He was the guy who, uh, let Sam Alito fly on his private jet for a, you know, a salmon fishing junket, um, in the late 2000s, a story that, that my colleagues were the first to report and that obviously caused a huge uproar. Um, but Singer, these donors brought together by Singer, uh, were given a private audience with Justice Thomas at the Supreme Court uh, in the first, you know, couple of months of the Trump administration, and Leonard Leo was the one who made it happen. And you know, there's just so much going on in this one story. I mean, Leo being the one to connect the donors and the justice, a justice meeting with donors at the Supreme Court. You know, the the, the absolute you know, uh, grandest symbol of what is supposed to be an impartial third branch of government. And also these are donors who, with Singer's help, you know, they get together and they try to elect Republicans and they try to push conservative causes. You know, this is not uh, the Rotary or, you know, some other civic association, some other, uh, you know, benign, nonpartisan, nonprofit club. I mean, these are people who are huge spenders almost entirely on conservative and Republican causes. So um, I think it just gives uh, you know, a really, really clear window into this, this, you know, the, the, these rooms where Leo and donors and justices and political figures 
all come together and yeah, have been coming so together sleazy. for years. So that people Ugh. people just did not know about this yep, until ProPublica yep. started reporting on it this year. Well, and, really great reporting. Hey, there are two other things, and I know we're running short on time. Yeah. One was that, like, again, we talk a lot here about state Supreme Courts, and as you can imagine, the Wisconsin State Supreme Court has been a big thing we've talked about. And I was stunned in reading this that Michael Gableman's name showed up because Michael Gableman <laughs> – Proved to be a lunatic, right? And after leaving the Supreme Court, he led that clown show of an investigation into the 2020 yeah. election and ended up being fired by the GOP House Speaker in Wisconsin, sued. It was a disaster. But Leo put him on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Does any of this blow back on Leo and his organization to donors who supported him say, man, you gave us an idiot. This was nothing but trouble for us. Is there any blowback for that? We don't we don't see any evidence that there was blowback because wow. you know these things with Gableman and even Dan Kelly and another yeah. you know, Wisconsinites will know yep. pretty well. Yep. You know th- these were strange choices for jurists on the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. Obviously, a really influential body on so many different things in such a critical state. Yep. You know, really in the in the in the headlines lately. But you know, as far as we can tell. Leo, even after Gableman and after Dan Kelly, continues to be someone who is highly sought after when it comes to state Supreme Court races. You know, Ron DeSantis, as we mentioned in the story, you know, many years after the Gableman stuff, Ron DeSantis essentially puts Leo in charge of a shadow council to pick who his Supreme Court, state Supreme Court in Florida, state Supreme Court nominees should be. So clearly... Leo's clout did not diminish, despite uh, Justice Gableman not being exactly uh, uh, a jurist that people look yeah. back on fondly. No, complete corrupt hack. Okay, let's talk about one more thing. Um, I, you're talking. I'm in Chicago right now, um, the uh, 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 home of a man named Said Bar, um, and uh, this is the guy who found a way through loopholes in the law to land another billion seven, I think. Um, uh, in Leonard Leo's lap to do what he wants with. And he's launched something called the Teneo Project. And I, for the life of me, have no idea what that is or what he wants to do. <laughs> Did you have, like, what what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can make this very easy for you. Uh, the Teneo Network is hoping to be um, for as many industries and American walks of life as possible what the Federalist Society was for the law, which is recruit people, bring them together, build a network, create these sort of pipelines where someone can go from Harvard Law to a clerkship at the Supreme Court to an AG's office to a federal court, maybe to the Supreme Court in two or three decades. That kind of machine that the Federalist Society was such a critical part of, Leo is basically taking his model and exporting it to media and to finance, to education, to all these other walks of life that are yeah. so important. And, and, and that, is, that is what his next step is. That is what the Teneo Network is trying to be. It is trying to be what it calls the, the talent pipeline for the future of America. Yeah, uh, that's what I thought. So he wants to be the HR manager that says, if you have the right politics, we'll make sure you have a successful career. And if not, no. Um, um, I, 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 there was a time I worked in, um, China, uh, in the nineties and the communist party, that was their job. Like if you're a party member, we're going to like, make sure that you have a career. And if not, not that it's just everything about this strikes me as terrifying and, um, um, counter to everything about sort of individual talent matters in America. You know, they think that this, that networks, I mean, Leo is a believer in networks. He's a believer in um, relationships. He's a believer that, um, you know, also someone who believes that his views and his faith and his legal philosophy are are besieged and uh, constantly under assault uh, from the left and that networks are what will make them successful. And I think he's really 
doubling down on this model. And I think you're really going to start to hear a lot more about the Teneo network in the years ahead, because we're going to see people who are starting media companies or getting elected to the U.S. Senate or maybe even running for president uh, and, and, and finding out that they are members of the Teneo network. So th- this is a big part of his vision here going forward. Yeah, I'm so glad that you have um, uh, flagged this and put it out there for us to watch. Um, and uh, I can't believe the uh, quality of this reporting. I'm sure none of it was easy. So thank you for your work. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Yep. All right, everybody. That um, <laughs> terrifying uh, conversation comes to you from Andy Kroll, who's uh, ProPublica reporter and he and his team, my gosh, they've done us a great service. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, uh, it's time to hear from you. So dial up. Let's hear what you have to say.